brought to you by CGTN Europe. Hello, I'm Stephen Cole and welcome to the Agenda podcast. Today, vaccine nationalism, questionable procurement schemes and broken promises. This is all the fallout of a bitter dispute over vaccines between the EU and the UK. As the two trade partners attempt to find a solution, we ask what part Brexit has played and why Anglo-Swedish manufacturer AstraZeneca has been caught in the crossfire. Joining me for this episode is the editor-in-chief of the online EU politics magazine Brussels Report, Peter Klepper, and molecular oncology specialist at the University of Warwick, Professor Lawrence Young. I began by asking Professor Young why speedy vaccine development was such a significant achievement. It's an incredible achievement of essentially of modern science and demonstrates what you can do when there is an urgent need and when you collaborate across the world. So this has really been a truly international effort. So you've had a successful collaboration around the world and it's set a very high bar for future, um, if you like, collaborations for producing vaccines, hasn't it? Yeah, I think I think this is going to change the face of the way that we do research, particularly infectious disease research and vaccine research, and has demonstrated how important it is that we that we do that we do collaborate. And I think one of the one of the legacies of this whole scenario, this whole pandemic, will be better international cooperation around infectious disease and, and vaccine development. Scientifically, how would you describe the challenge? I think the challenge is one where it's been difficult in the sense that One's had to to hit the ground running, developing novel diagnostics, trying to understand more and more about the the way the virus infects people and the way the body's immune system works, whilst also developing a vaccine. And I think once we have the luxury of time, we can get even cleverer in the way that we design vaccines. But it's for sure that the type of technology, particularly the technology around um, mRNA vaccines, has changed the face of 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 the way that we treat disease, not only infectious disease, but cancer, probably forever. And Peter Klepper, an an amazing achievement, as you've just heard Professor Young talk about, uh, in getting a vaccine so quickly. Then the politics kicked in. (laughs) What went wrong? (laughs) Well, indeed, it's quite a a contrast, isn't it? So um, scientists came up with, in no time, with a vaccine that uh, few people would have uh, hoped for at least in such a short time. And then um, I think now we're we're nearing a a situation of, I would say, vaccine protectionism, uh, whereby not just in Europe, but also in places like India, there are more and more calls to uh, to sort of interrupt the the global supply chains of uh, vaccines. Um, And of course, you don't have to be an expert uh, to be able to understand that this is a grave danger. Um, Many people are not yet vaccinated. Uh, any delay costs life, it's as simple as that. The Pfizer said that uh, the component of their vaccines are, are coming from 18 different countries. So um, any attempt to, um, to delay, restrict, uh, interrupt that process, if not with uh, actual restrictions, but only with bureaucracy, costs life. Uh, and that's, uh, that's incredibly unfortunate, of course. Uh, well, Peter, Pfizer also said... Uh, this week, that EU export controls have become a burden for Pfizer, and they are criticising this, this, th- these border controls on their products or making the products. The president of the European Commission has, has made no attempt to hide that this is pointed uh, at the UK, uh, even if uh, if uh, you would actually have um, restrictions on vaccines uh, flowing from the EU to the UK. Um, at best, the EU could only win one week, whereas uh, the United Kingdom, its vaccination rollout could be delayed by, by two months. So this would be disastrous. Professor Young, I saw you uh, nodding there, and we started sort of very positively and optimistically about how much collaboration there had been. How much collaboration did it need to produce the vaccine? Uh, and Peter's talking about, you know, different parts of the vaccine perhaps produced in different countries? Yeah, I think there's three different aspects of this. One is the basic science that goes behind developing vaccines, and that's where there's been a lot of international collaboration. No question about that. 
The second part, obviously, which starts to get a little bit more difficult, I think, is the whole issue of manufacture. What this has highlighted is a worldwide deficiency in manufacturing capacity for these complex vaccines. They're not straightforward. They're biological entities and they're difficult to produce. And you know, it's ridiculous that we have to rely on places like you know, the, the Serum Institute in India, for instance. It's crazy that we just don't have and have not prepared ourselves to have the appropriate manufacturing facilities and indeed the supply of raw materials and I think the third thing which starts to obviously edge into what Peter's discussing around politics in a way is the the whole approach to procurement and contracting for vaccines so in a way this takes it away from the basic science that produced these wonderful vaccines remember there are tens of companies tens of different vaccines now being tested in different stages that's been marvelous but you can't do that if you don't have the manufacturing capacity and you don't have a, a robust approach to procurement. And I think that's where things are, uh, are becoming increasingly challenging. Do you think, Professor Young, this will change the way Big Pharma <coughs> operates in future um, in terms of creating their own world separate from politics? I think, I think it will create a different approach to the way that we think about manufacturing. I also think there's something really interesting in all of this. You know, there are many, many lessons to learn. It's quite interesting, is it not, that the AstraZeneca-Oxford vaccine is being produced at cost, and, and yet it's obviously suffering a lot. Um, and a lot of these other vaccines obviously are, are, are making quite significant profits. Uh, there's nothing wrong with making a profit. But I think in the current situation, I think it's in... I think not only do the big pharma companies need to think about manufacturing but also governments need to be concerned i think for the future about the preparedness for this type of uh, this type of event and what it means for the future rollout of vaccines not only in their own countries but the responsibility we all have to think about this in the de in developing countries as well and i'll put that to peter in a moment but before i go to peter uh, professor young the uk has taken a very different approach uh, to the EU in terms of prioritising the first dose. H has that paid off? It has, I have to say. I was a little sceptical myself about that, actually, particularly as early data was coming in and we were unsure about the whole issue of the second dose. Very important, as we know, that is, it's always really important to get a booster dose. But now looking at the data as it's coming through, it's absolutely right that the that, that was that that was the correct approach. And what we've done also is is prioritise obviously older folk for, for for vaccination and protected the most vulnerable. And we can see that now in the UK with the you know, significant, amazing fall in the number of cases, hospitalisations, and deaths. It's been a remarkable effect in in a relatively short period of time, actually. Peter Klepper, how would you compare the rollouts of the EU and the UK? Uh, well, the, the figures speak uh, for itself. Uh, the UK has been quicker uh, to uh, first approve the vaccine. This is a um, responsibility of the, of the UK agency, not of politics. Uh, now, the, the European Medicine Agency was slightly slower, but not that much slower, so I wouldn't really put the delays down to that. The root of the problem in the EU is that the um, European Commission has not been um, contract uh, has not been negotiating uh, well with these big pharma companies. Um, uh, Israel, for example, pays uh, two and a half uh, times the price that the EU pays for the Pfizer vaccine. So, according to many um, analysts, this is one of the reasons why Israel has secured more vaccine. We can't be sure. It's uh, And was also one of the obscure. early successful countries, wasn't it? Exactly. Of course, Israel has also um, uh, permitted that some of the data of uh, related to its citizens being vaccinated is being shared with Pfizer. In Europe, perhaps uh, people would not be happy uh, with that. Uh, so, so, I mean, it's a complex story. Also, the EU has been accusing one of the vaccine producers, AstraZeneca, of violating its contract. Also, when um, when lawyers looked at the contract, this was far from clear that this was the case. And despite the fact that the French government has been uh, threatening to start legal action uh, well, against indeed. the EU over this... Uh, Thierry Brecon, the EU's internal market chief, is saying mm. zero AstraZeneca jabs made on the continent would be shipped across the channel until the company, he says, fulfills its commitments to Europe.
could that be the right decision? I mean, it can't, can it? Well, I think it's absolutely wrong here eh, because this is a, uh, a violation of uh, of contracts. Eh? Uh, the, the contract is is not between the EU and AstraZeneca here that is being violated, but uh, between the UK and AstraZeneca. Uh, so when the EU uh, goes off to rip on, rip up uh, contracts, I think it's not exactly um, you know um, assuring the trust of, of future uh, pharma investments well, in the exactly. world. Exactly. And, 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 and uh, 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 Professor Young, I mean, this kind of vaccine nationalism must have people like yourself, the medical experts, the scientific experts, pulling their hair out because they've worked so yeah, fast. It is. It's, 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 it's a terrible thing. And the bottom line, and come back to what Peter says, you know, this is costing lives. And for us, the, 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 what we've been doing is working really hard to get these vaccines out to save lives. And it's just really, really sad uh, that politics is getting in the way of all this. Can you give us some perspective? Because there were concerns um, uh, from Germany and from France and from Spain about the use uh, of AstraZeneca in causing blood clots. Was that a genuine reason to um, inhibit the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine? Well, it's important that any adverse serious events associated with any medicine, including these vaccines, is investigated. It's quite clear that, that these clots are very, very, very rare, um, but they still need to be investigated. And what you have to do in your own country is compare the, uh, the, the blood clots with the levels that you'd see in a normal unvaccinated population. And indeed, a recent report that came out in the last 24 hours from Denmark shows that there's no real increased risk of blood clotting associated with vaccination. When you're rolling out a vaccine across millions of people, sadly, some of these people will get other illnesses that are nothing to do with the vaccination. But they do need to be investigated. The question is, is it appropriate to pause va life-saving vaccination when um, you have a very rare event or should you continue? I'll give you one piece of information about that, which is if you vaccinate a million people um, in, uh, in looking at the German data alone, you'd expect um, 12 to have a blood clots and perhaps four of them to die. But if the same population get infected with COVID, then out of a, out of a million people, 20,000 would die. So I think what the issue is here is getting some perspective, recognising, of course, that you must investigate serious adverse events. But Pausing vaccination on that basis is a, is a very dangerous thing to do because more people will die. Joining us for the second half of this discussion is the UK Director of the European Centre for International Political Economy, David Hennig. I asked David how relevant the vaccine rift was to Brexit. Brexit is going to be a backdrop for all UK, EU um, um, tr trade and uh, political relations. Um, from a trade point of view, you have vaccines um, and uh, the, their ingredients um, as part of huge supply chains going between the, uh, the UK and the EU. So you can't simplify and say that, you know, we've managed to, uh, to make all our own vaccines. Clearly, there have been, there have been uh, big supply chains. Some of our vaccines have come from the EU. It's not always entirely clear uh, why the UK has done so well, but it is quite clear to me that the UK has done better than the, uh, the EU in organising uh, vaccines. Um, and, and it is very interesting that I think the EU has responded badly to that. I think that they don't like it, but I'm not sure that either the UK or the EU quite know why that has happened in, in that way. And Peter Klepper, uh, would the cynic say if it wasn't vaccines, it would be something else post-Brexit? Well, there's two things I think that uh, distinguish the UK from the EU. First of all, the UK did not uh, uh, take part in the joint uh, EU27 negotiations with big pharma companies. And secondly, the UK also, when it was still bound by EU law at the end of uh, December, they opted for an exception a procedure uh, that would allow them to, uh, to, um, uh, to approve the Pfizer vaccine uh, much more quickly than the, than the EU. Now, um, both things, in theory, could have happened uh, with the UK still being a member state of the EU. But I think it's fair to say that politically the pressure would have been much, uh, much more strong uh, for the UK uh, not to do that and to, to follow the EU. And thereby, especially when it comes to the vaccine procurements, 
also uh, ending up in the place where EU countries are today, which is uh, they do not uh, get enough uh, vaccines. And uh, Professor Young, um, the EU and UK have come to blows over vaccine rollouts. But generally, is Europe uh, and Great Britain uh, in accord on medical and scientific issues? Yeah, I think there's still a lot of enormous amount of cooperation and, and, and engagement. Uh, certainly, even personally, I have a lot of interaction with colleagues across uh, across Europe. I don't think any of this uh, wrangle is getting in the way of that cooperation. But clearly, there's a lot of a lot of frustration. And David Hennig, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, uh, Czech Republic, they've all either bought or are looking at uh, potentially other vaccines, uh, the Russian vaccine Sputnik, uh, the Chinese vaccines. Uh, these are yet to be approved by the EU, aren't, aren't they? Uh, and how long could it take for them to approve them? What I think we're seeing um, across across Europe, and I think this is this we'd be seeing is in any country that's not doing so well in vaccinations, is a degree of, uh, of a panicked response. I think that... Um, the EU's response has been somewhat less than sure-footed since January, when they first threatened uh, ex export bans, and it's even um, and it's continued now. Even though on EU forecasts they're actually going to have um, a significant uh, number of vaccines arriving in the next three months, and they're hoping, I think the the, the forecast is for seventy percent of uh, of EU citizens to be vaccinated by uh, be before before summer. So. I do think a lot of a lot of this still still coming down to um, the EU just struggling to cope with something that is not apparently going their way, and I think it does raise questions about the the leadership in the uh, in the European Commission. Uh, it's gone it's gone against them, and I don't think they've responded very well. And individual member states as well. You're see, you're seeing a certain amount of panic. So I don't think that bodes very well for uh, for for the EU's. Uh, uh, the, the way the EU is 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 run, um, particularly if this is what happens because the UK has done a bit better. And Professor Young, has the UK done better because it's smaller than the bloc, the EU bloc, and it can move faster? I think it's done better for several reasons. I mean, obviously, aside from the fact that the establishment of the the vaccine task force and the procurement of more than three hundred and fifty million doses of different vaccines took place through those um, contractual negotiations. That went well. We learned a very tough lesson through our test and trace system last year and how important it is to mobilise our national health system. And so I think the great success story here is that mobilisation of the local, regional, national health service to deliver vaccinations. And that's worked amazingly well, supported, I have to say, by incredible people volunteering. And that's what's led to the situation we have today where over 95% of folks over the age of 60 now are, are vaccinated in the UK. Um, heaven forbid there is, Professor Young, another pandemic, anything like this. If there was something in the near future, are we better prepared, better ready for a pandemic of this scale? I think this has all been this has been a, a, a horrible wake up call for all of us about about pandemics. I mean, we know that parts of the world are familiar with this and, and actually responded much more quickly, particularly Southeast Asia. We've all learned a lesson. We're going through an interesting situation in the UK at the moment. As of today, we have a new Institute for Health Protection that's going that was this was on the cards anyway, but it's been fast tracked. So a, a slightly different approach to public health. We, like many countries, had perhaps under invested in public health and public health infrastructure. And I think this is going to change quite quite markedly now, along with a much better sort of engagement across the NHS academia and industry, that collaborative interaction that's so important. I think we've learned lots of lessons for the future, and I'm sure we're going to be much, much better prepared. David Hennig, uh, we've seen perhaps some examples of vaccine nationalism. Uh, does that extend to trade protectionism as well post-Brexit? Trade protectionism is rising globally at the moment, and you know, that includes the UK, it includes the, uh, the EU, and I think that that is going to, to continue. I think that what we're seeing is that um, many countries are saying, why, why, are, why are we importing so much? We're vulnerable. We need to, to build more resilience into our networks. It's not entirely clear to me. In fact, it's, I, I think, the opposite. I think that they will actually be reducing their... Uh, 
their, their resilience in case of future crises by putting up trade barriers. But at the moment, the uh, the trend is very much towards uh, trade barriers, and I think we can we can expect this to continue. And it doesn't help when the uh, when the European Commission threatens to uh, to put up barriers. But equally, the UK is not innocent. We also have export barriers from on various drugs as well. So I'm I'm afraid this is the direction where we're going in. And I really would like to see more efforts between the UK, the EU, the US, and others to try to prevent that happening. Can you see Peter Klepper? a new body being formed by the European Union to deal with crises like this so the EU can move faster and together as a bloc? I don't think we need more uh, uh, bureaucracies. I mean, national administrations are well fit. It's, of course, a great thing to work together in a, in a crisis, but I think it has to happen um, bottom up. Um, also, this talk of um, sort of strategic reserves and, and uh, repatriating production capacity. I mean, I'm based in Belgium. I'm from Belgium. This is, let's say, the world's vaccine center. But still, uh, even, even UK export restrictions could uh, bring um, the production of certain vaccines, like the Pfizer vaccine, to a halt. So, so that's, that's the best um, uh, you know, uh, illustrative uh, illustration that how hard it is uh, to, to no longer be dependent of other countries. So ultimately, the best, as David also said, the best defense is that, uh, you know, you, you don't have trade barriers. And, and the best contribution that the EU can, um, can deliver at this very moment is to, to, to throw overboard all this uh, vaccine uh, export restrictions. And David Hennig, do you think the EU has lost some of its credibility because of the way it's handled the distribution of vaccines uh, in this pandemic? Well, I think in terms of trade and in terms of political governance, credibility ebbs and flows. There are always mistakes and there are always... Uh, but this is good, a pretty big moments. mistake that's costing people's uh, lives, isn't well, it? Well, I think that if in, if in three months' time uh, a substantial percentage of EU citizens are vaccinated, then I think that... Uh, over, over time, that uh, that is no longer quite seen as as, as badly. If, on the other hand, that that isn't the case, and if you go into summer um, with with restrictions still in place, then I think the the, the loss of credibility is greater. But I think we overdo, um, and particularly in the UK, people overdo the um, uh, the loss of credibility of the EU. If you heard various commentators in the EU, the uh, in the UK, sorry, the EU is always uh, losing losing uh, credibility. But I don't, I, you know, I think that the uh, the EU will will bounce back from uh, from this. But what we what we can hope is that it uh, it does the it does the right things. It's certainly a, a setback to, to bounce back from. I don't think it's a huge loss of credibility. All right. Yet. Well, we're, yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, Professor Young and uh, David Hennig and Peter Klepper. Thank you all, gentlemen, very much. As we've been looking at the vaccine rift here on the agenda. And that brings us to the end of another edition of The Agenda. Join me again next week when I'll be looking at the future of transport and electric cars. Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher and Spotify. You can also find us on CGTN Europe, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world, can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve? Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.